Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I would like to welcome uh, all the participants who are online and offline in this hybrid event uh, today within this uh, lecture series, The Future of Europe uh, in a Global Context. Let me welcome our today's speakers, who are a speaker, uh, Paul Hockenus. Uh, he arrived to us uh, from Berlin. He is a writer, journalist uh, with educational background, uh, as he's an American uh, from the US, but uh, also still uh, studied at the Freie Universität uh, in West Berlin, that time was still West Berlin, but uh, also at the University of Sussex, uh, the, uh, the political science and the study of uh, political thought and uh, social and uh, uh, political thought. Uh, and uh, it's interesting that he was already at the the change of the system here in Hungary and also uh, in the 90s in uh, different post-Yugoslav uh, countries. So the topics today connects to Germany, which is uh, one of the main uh, states within the European Union. So the future of Europe is definitely not dividable for, uh, from uh, Germany. And... Uh, Actually, he is not only expert uh, in Germany and writes about Germany, but also uh, in the last two, three years, uh, strongly involved in climate change, uh, energy policy matters. Uh, so I think that will be somehow also your presentation. Oh, thank you very much, Aniko, and you know, I want to thank, of course, the, the Institute and, and Ferenc and Jody and everybody for inviting me. I'm very um, honored to be here and um, you know, looking forward to addressing you and, and to answering your questions and to having a discussion afterwards, because I'm actually going to, to end my presentation with, with a question that will reflect on, on Central Europe, and so I'd really like to, to broaden out the discussion. Um, let me say right away that my thesis is as a dire one. Um, I think that conservatism in Europe, in Germany, um, but everywhere in Europe is in a crisis at the moment. Um, once Angela Merkel leaves power, there will not be a modern, democratic, conservative in party, progress. party in all of continental Europe. Uh, conservatism, I will say, is Janice-faced. There are liberal and illiberal versions of conservatism that often exist within the same political parties and in tension with one another. And I'm going to be looking at those tensions as they move through the Christian Democratic Party in Germany. Um, um, most of the modern right parties in Europe have disappeared, for example, in France and in Italy. Um, others, like the Austrian People Party, have more or less capitulated to the far right. This makes the Christian Democratic Union, German Christian Democra the, um, democracy, uh, which remains a very democratic form of Christian democracy, more important than ever. It stands, however, as Merkel leaves the party at a crossroads. And there are liberal and illiberal currents within the CDU and the CSU, the Bavarian sister party of the Christian Democratic Union, the Christian Social Democratic Union, that are at tension and at odds with one another. I also want to argue that Europe has never needed modern conservatism more than it is, does today, that it plays an essential role in democracies, and this is really a, a, a radical thesis in the sense that you know, many critics, many scholars of conservatism who say that conservatism is itself inherently reactionary or is a stepping stone to the far right, which it can also be. Um, but, um, the far, and, but these conservative parties can play a role as a buffer between the far right and the democratic structures in democracies. Uh, where they're not strong, the far right can come to power and undermine democracy. And we are seeing that, I think we've seen that in many places in Central Europe and we're seeing it in Western Europe as well. Now, let me first start out by saying some words about the CDU itself, because it is really a quite, a, quite a unique party. I mean, of the 72 years of the Federal Republic of Germany, it has uh, maintained the chancellorship for 52 of those years. Um, 
It is a, it is a classic uh, big tent party. It has managed over the decades to bring together under, under one tent Catholics and Protestants and non-believers. It has attracted the voters from uh, workaday Germans to the business elite. Uh, until very recently, both Germans from rural and urban neighborhoods. And since it has been a classic Volkspartei, mainly a party that appeals over a broad um, spectrum of voters, um, something that today it no longer does. Um, let me talk a little bit about conservatism itself, actually. Um, The yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I got you. Um, uh, um, among 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 the core concepts of, of conservatism are nation, family, patriotism, tradition, private property, ownership, law and order. Now, usually, conservatives aren't really big on ideas and vision. Um, they think that basically their role is to, to rule. Um, conservatism, um, and, and this also, and also in conservatism, there's a suspicion of transformation and change. The idea is to preserve and conserve uh, whatever uh, power or um, uh, institutions or, or the hierarchies that um, exist at the time. And so they often appeal to primarily those people who, who are doing well at the time. I also would argue that there's actually kind of an illiberal um, current in inherent in conservatism in that it is against transformation. And liberalism is transformative, modernizing. It's anti-traditionalist. And, and this is something where there's, you know, there is one of the places where this, this tension between illiberal and liberal currents exist. Uh, in talking about uh, conservatism today, I'm going to be dis distinguishing very broadly between two kinds of conservatism, a liberal conservatism and an illiberal conservatism. And for the, for the synonyms for liberal conservative, we're going to also be talking about democratic conservatism, the center right, modern Christian democracy. I'm basically putting those in one category. Another category, illiberal conservatism, we can call radical conservatism. There's a new book out in German by the uh, Austrian political scientist Natasha Strubo, whose um, the book is the title is Radicaler Conservativismus, or National Populism, the Far Right, the Extreme Right. And so what distinguishes between these two concepts of conservatism and why is it so important? That's what I'm going to be talking about. And I think I've formulated five questions that we want to ask about the CDU and the CDU over its uh, decades in power, but also about all other conservative parties in, in Eastern and in Western Europe. So one main question, very, very important, is when a conservative, conservative party, when it speaks about the nation, is it talking about an ethnic nation, a Volksgemeinschaft in German, a, an ethnic community made up just of that um, people and their bloodline or, or their race or ethnicity? Or are they talking about a civic nation, one that's based on citizenship and which all members of the state who will have citizenship, have the same equal rights regardless of their race, ethnicity, or their original nationality. Very important. A second criteria, you know, is does this party have a single leader that it follows more or less blindly? Or is it a party with democratic structures that elects and then takes out of office uh, different uh, leaders? Is there leadership? Is there party structure, a democratic one, or is it top down? And how top down is it? Is there a separation between church and state? I said church uh, is extremely important religion for conservatism. Um, how important and what role does it play in the state? Does the party accept the current state borders, or does it have territorial ambitions beyond its present borders? And lastly, does this party or uh, conservative ideology, does it accept the opposition 
as a legitimate opposition who rep that represents legitimately other voters who do not vote for their party, or do they see them as an enemy and a rival? And so I'm going to be looking at those questions and those issues as I walk you through some of the decades of Christian democracy and how, how it developed in Germany. And I think all, just about all of the categories um, are um, applicable beyond, um, beyond Germany itself. Um, and I think that today we have a very modern Christian democracy um, after the years of Angela Merkel. It's a model of liberal conservatism, as far as I'm concerned. It's a preeminent conservative party in, in Europe. And yet it has walked a fine line between liberal and illiberal conservatism over the years. Um, when the, the CDU and CSU, they came to life, you know, after the Second World War, uh, out of the splinterings of three conservative parties from the Weimar Republic era, um, you could argue that they were liberal, had the liberal and also very illiberal currents in them. Um, <laughs> when, I, when I think of the way that Germany and the CDU arose in that period in the late 40s and early 50s, I think of Roberto Rossellini's classic film, Germania Anno Nullo, uh, one, of, one of my favorite films, which the, the Rossellini's thesis, I think, is that there really is no such thing as a year zero. There is no, no, no tabla rosa. There's no starting point where there's, there's nothing before it. And that the, the pasts of these people, the different per characters in the uh, film, you know, most um, most predominantly the the protagonist Edmund, the twelve year old boy, twelve years of Nazi rule, and how these this this period affects him, his psyche, his mentality, and all of the, the people around him. You know, nothing starts at zero, and indeed, conservatism in uh, post war Germany didn't start at zero either. Um, it had strong illiberal and liberal currents. Of course, among the liberal currents, uh, well, well, I mean, it included, for example, among its uh, founders, uh, people who belonged to the resistance. There were people who, 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 who walked a fine line between a uh, resistance at times and in cooperation, like Konrad Adenauer himself, um, the, 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 the chief of the, the, the CDU and the Germany's first chancellor who we'll talk about more extensively, but also Nazis, highly ranking Nazis were high up in the party. They were high up in the German government right up until the late 1960s. Uh, officials from the Nazi party dominated different parts of the administration in post-war Germany, the judiciary, the foreign ministry, education, they were everywhere. There was not a thorough uh, coming to grips with the past in the, in the early years of the, of the Christian Democratic Union. Uh, this, of course, is Konrad Adenauer. Um, he personified post-war conservatism. His face, his body language, his, his, his language itself, his very conservative traditional values, um, which included, um, I mean, on the one hand, uh, the early CDU and Adenauer, and they had they were they were they were strongly uh, liberal in the sense that they were transformative at the beginning. I said that conservative parties aren't transformative, but what could be more transformative than a democratic party that wants to make, make a break with the Nazi past? Um, they embraced constitutionalism, um, a constitution in the form of the Grundgesetz, which wasn't actually called a constitution for certain reasons that aren't really applicable here, but functioned as one. You know, a, a constitution with human rights, parliamentary de democracy, multi-parties, elections, all of the trappings of a, of a healthy democracy, which Germany indeed grew into. That said, there were also strong illiberal characteristics to this party too. It was and remains to today very top-down although not as much as it was in the 1950s under Adenauer. The CDU has changed over the years and become much more liberal. And it's this that I'm going to, this trajectory that I'm going to follow. There was not a post-war coming to grips with the past. Um, there were Nazis in all of its ranks. Adenauer's CDU believed basically heads down and forward with the economic recovery, the Wirtschaftswunder, and leave any reckoning with the past to a, another time. Um, it was very old fashioned in many different ways. Its attitude towards women and sexuality really wasn't a whole lot different than the German Empire. Kinder, 
Kirche, Kirche, uh, children, you know, the kitchen, the church. This was the, the this was the, the role seen for 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 women and the and the family. Men could determine whether or not their wives would work. Um, people under 21 years old, men and women weren't allowed in the same room together. Uh, corporal punishment was was common in schools. Um, it was very, very conservative. Um, another aspect of the conservatism, which I feel is illiberal, and that is the anti-communism and the way that the CDU used anti-communism as a cudgel to beat down any leftist tendencies, um, primarily was the social Democrats, but then also when the student movement came along. And I feel that, that I certainly don't think that anti-communism as such is illiberal. Ferens wouldn't agree with that for a second, of course, but the way that the Sadi who used it skewed the discourse. Um, here, for example, we have a, a CDU poster from 1953, Alle Wege des Marxismus führen nach Moscow. It's aimed at the, at the Social Democrats, you know, all, all kinds of Marxism lead to Moscow. Um, the Cold War was in full bloom and it was used for all of its propaganda possible by the, by the CDU, in which I think was an illiberal way. And then also very important to the CDU, one of its most uh, loyal, if not its most loyal voting constituency were the Vertriebene Verbände, the Expellees Associations. There were 14 million uh, uh, re uh, refugees expelled from Eastern Europe, Central and Eastern Europe um, after the Second World War, including from Hungary, among them, the family of, of Yashka Fischer. And um, one of my, my third book is a biography of Yashka Fischer. But many, um, and Yashka Fischer's family, I don't think, well, they, they, they were Sadi voters, but many of the Fetri Benavenda, the, their very purpose was to one day move back to where they came from. And that was under, that would then be under Germany's wing. I mean, they wanted those parts of Germany that, that, they, that they were expelled from to come back under Germany's wing. And the CDU kept these lives, uh, uh, these, these hopes alive. Uh, maps from the time that were in German schools showed the 1937 borders of Germany, you know, including Silesia, Pomerania, um, Kaliningrad, and other parts of, 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 the, German, um, of the German Empire. Um, the government led by the CDU refused to accept the eastern border of Eastern Germany, that's the, the, the Odenise Grenze, as Germany's border. Um, they saw that still as open and the question of how, what kind of borders a democratic Germany ultimately would have, once of course it unified with, with Eastern Germany, um, you know, was, was, was left open. So there we have it. You know, we have liberal and illiberal tendencies together at once in this party. Now, over the course of the 60s and the 70s and the 80s, um, the Christian democracy uh, modernized. Uh, Adenauer left power in 1962, and in 1969, Willy Brandt and the Social Democrats took over and this put the CDU into opposition, where it had to do some thinking long and hard about what it was all about. I mean, in lateral, there were, there were tendencies and currents within the Federal Republic that were pushing for modernization, change, and liberalization, which, which impacted directly or indirectly uh, the CDU itself. I mean, artists and um, intellectuals like Gunter Grass and Heinrich Böll and uh, the, the, the films of Wolfgang Staute and others were very critical of Germany's, the, 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 the continuities between the Nazi past and contemporary Germany. Of course, in the 1960s, I know this, the student movement harshly criticized uh, the old Nazis in power and the conservatism of, of the country. Uh, institutions were created in, in, during, during the Adenauer era, era itself. For example, in 1958, the Central Office of the Land Ju uh, Judicial Authorities for the Investigation of National Socialist Crimes in Ludwigsburg, which turned out to be uh, the main institution which tracked down uh, Nazi criminals in Germany and, and brought them to, to justice. And Germany becomes a, a, the motor of the European Union. Um, uh, uh, and of course, uh, Willy Brandt's 
uh, and the Social Democrats of uh, more than decade in power brought changes to Germany that 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 that, that changed Christian Demac Democrats as well. In the 1970s, the new social movements, the women's movement, the peace movement, the anti-nuclear movement changed the way all Germans think. You know, there was a, a it was vastly important in the, the liberalizing and modernizing of Germany. Um, and that changed, that changed um, the, the CDU as well. Uh, the second generation of, of the CDU comes when it's, um, Oh, okay, Willy Brandt, okay, in 1970, you know, kneeling, taking a knee in, in Warsaw, um, you know, an incredibly um, transformative moment in Germany where he, Germany, you know, takes full responsibility for the crimes of the Nazi era and um, something that uh, was, would have been inconceivable for, for Adenauer to do. It was not done uh, by, the, by the Christian Democrats. In 1978, and this is from the, 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 the women's movement, very important as well. It made its way into the CDU kind of through a back door. Um, here again, we have the women's movement. Uh, women demand another, another story. Um, here we see also you know, older women involved as well, not just, not just younger women. And in 1982, Helmut Kohl becomes chancellor, bringing in a new era of the Christian of Christian democracy. Uh, one, more, I mean, one less completely dominated by elder men, but still dominated by elder men. One less hostile to women and to questions of of, of sexuality and and identity. You know, by this time, you know, many of the old Nazis had simply died, and they they peeled off. Um, the necessity of, of a coming to terms of the past was accepted by the CDU, if not really enthusiastically endorsed. Um, the, the, the party itself created structures that linked its members and its leaders. Um, uh, there were you know, a number of different reforms brought in by Cole and some of the more liberal members of the party uh, during the 1980s, including in 1987. And here we're also moving direction, um, you know, talking about the, the Energiewende, although its birth was in the environmental movement and the Greens and the, the anti-nuclear movement. It was not something that was um, brought to life by the Christian Democrats. The Christian Democrats in the 1980s would never have used the word Energiewende. Uh, they, would have they would have laughed at it. Nevertheless, in 1987, the first Ministry for the Environment and Nuclear Safety was created under, under um, Helmut Kohl's uh, uh, government. And as the 80s moved in, moved, moved, moved onward, uh, the, the, the Christian Democrats actually began to look again older and out of touch with society. Um, that changed in 1989 when the wall fell. And in 1990, Helmut Kohl leads the country to unification. Uh, Germany is seen as such a democratic country that almost all the countries around it uh, accept unification. Germany recognizes the western, the, the, excuse me, the eastern border of Germany as its final um, and definitive border, and um, Germany moves into the 1990s with Helmut Kohl in power. Um, although the party itself, Kohl, has run out of steam ideas and very many um, new modernizing ideas. Um, here you see him in East Germany. The Eastern Germans famously, you know, called him Helmut, and um, he found a new lease on life uh, with unification that led, enabled him to lead the country for eight more years. Uh, one of his ministers was a young woman by the name of Angela Merkel, who was the, um, she was the minister for women's issues and family, and then became the federal environment minister in, in 1996. At the time, she spoke in a very open and um, concerned way about climate change. She was completely for Germany and other European countries and beyond accepting the, the Kyoto Protocol. She is, of course, was a physicist herself and understood the, the, 
the problem, as well as she did the dangers of nuclear power, which she, which, which she talked very openly about. Um, and um, two years later, though, uh, new elections brought into power the red-green government. Uh, so the Christian Democrats leave power for the second time. You now here we basically have the, the generation of the student movement coming to power, Gerhard Schroeder on the left, Joschka Fischer of the Greens in the middle, and Oscar Lafontaine on the right. You know, the class, a very classic picture. Um, and this then shortly thereafter is where the energy Vende begins in 2000, the, the red green government uh, passed into law, uh, the Erneuerbare Energie Gesetz, the Renewable Energy Resources Act, which put into law price supports for renewable energy. Now, in 2000, when this happened, this was not like a major, this didn't make headlines in Germany. It wasn't seen as one that even went by the time they left power in 2005 as a, as a major piece of, of, of red-green legislation. It was only what it allowed. It opened the way along with very importantly, European Union deregulation of uh, the energy markets that enabled private energy producers to sell renewable energy to the grid. The grid had to accept it and remunerate them in a way that included price supports that made it them avail that made that that guaranteed then that investors in renewable energy would be paid back that there that that that, that banks would then loan to them loan to them and that those, these loans would then be repaid and this was the seed of the energy vendor and this feed in tariff model it call it's called has been copied in hundreds of countries around the world in order to promote the expansion of renewable energy and this is one of the, if not the major uh, accomplishment of this government. Immediately though, even before that law, they passed a new citizenship law. Um, until then, citizenship in Germany had still been one of bloodlines. I mean, in order to be a German citizen, you basically you know, had to have German blood in your, in your veins. You had to prove that you were um, you know, ethnically a German. And they changed this, opening up the, the definition of citizenship and thus the, the definition of, of, of Germany um, itself. Um, they left power in, in, in 2005. Um, and I'd say what I would call the third phase of, 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 of German Christi uh, Christian democracy began with um, a person who's very person. Uh, reflect, you know, was was it was it was a complete break with Christian democracy of old. She wasn't Catholic. She was a Protestant. She was a man. She was a woman. She wasn't West German. She was East German. She was a professional. She was a physicist. She was divorced. And actually, when she joined the CDU um, after unification, she was living with her husband, with her second oh, second partner, and it was actually um, CDU higher ups who encouraged them to, to get married. Uh, she's childish, childless, she's childless. Um, so, I mean, in her, her very person, she reflected an entirely new uh, form of, of Christian democracy. Um, she, at the beginning of her uh, chancellery, um, she was deemed the, the, the climate chancellor. Here she is in Greenland in front of a melting glacier. Uh, when Germany was head of the, the I think that the, the 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 EU Council and the 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 G8, and she made climate one of the one of the main priorities. I mean, she also issued in a whole lot of legislation that uh, changed the role of of women, um, introduced paternity leave, and not just maternity leave for for parents. Uh, stem cell research and uh, many other things that put conservatives in the party up in arms. This said, Angela Merkel never really, from the beginning to the end, had a vision or an ideology of conservatism. I mean, she never really had a, a, a plan or a strategy or, or a clear a agenda. I mean, a lot of the reforms that she made were pruning away at the uh, outdated old school coal um, ideology and, 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 and times. Um, 
it was it was piecemeal and and, and kind of erratic and you know not not long after um, after she came to office, she seemed to kind of you know run, run, run out of ideas. And I mean, my my argument is that over the last seven or eight years, you could say that um, I mean, she was running on empty. A lot of the changes that were made, or the things that have defined the Merkel uh, government, came about as crises, partially created by. Merkel's own inaction, I would argue. But nevertheless, um, you've got the euro crisis. And of course, you have the migration crisis. When you speak of the, I mean, the CDU was never a party that was enthusiastic about having people of foreign nationalities come and move to Germany unless they were guest workers and promised to go back. And it turns out that they didn't go back. And the CDU was not a party that was for in favor of integrating uh, these these. Uh, people of Turkish, Italian, Spanish, Portuguese background in Yugoslav into um, into Germany. Um, they were really quite befuddled about what to do with them and how to deal with them. That's, until today, I don't think the party has a migration policy that really makes any sense. Uh, and then, of course, came the the migration crisis of, of 2015 uh, when Merkel stunned many of her fellow Christian Democrats by not turning back. It wasn't that she opened Germany to these migration flows. She just didn't shut down the borders as they were coming Germany's way. Um, And uh, she was hailed by moderates and social Democrats and Greens as as refugees and these needy people flowed into Germany. And then she was uh, criticized by them when she finally she closed the border in 2016, leaving us basically with the situation more or less that we that we have today: a Europe with surrounded by by fences and and and, and barbed wire. I mean, another very important uh, moment was uh, 2011 when the Fukushima uh, nuclear accident happened in Japan. Uh, Merkel, who had as I said, as an environment minister, had criticized nuclear power. And then when she came to power uh, in 2005, was ambivalent about it. Then a new coalition came four years later when she was, uh, the Christian Democrats were in coalition, not with the Social Democrats, but with the Free Democratic Party, the Liberals, who were pro-nuclear power. They voted to revoke what the Greens and the Red Greens had um, decided about nuclear power and extend the power plants. Then came Fukushima, and then she flip-flopped again back over to um, no, we're going to shut down the nuclear power plants. I think she shut down three automatically and said the rest would shut down next year. The final nuclear power plants will close in Germany, a situation that will leave Germany in a very, in a way, kind of an embarrassing position because we will need more, Germany will need more coal plants online uh, when the nuclear power plants go offline. Nevertheless, that is what is is going to happen. Um, I mean, here, okay. Let me let me let me kind of like move a little bit now into the energy vendor uh, a little bit more um, uh, directly because during the Merkel era, we have we saw an incredible expansion of nuclear energy. It was result not of any of really of her legislation or doing, but of the Renewable Energy Sources Act of, of 2000 that I mentioned. And so what you see here is a remarkable growth from 2002 until the present, particularly of onshore wind and solar energy. It's PV, photovoltaic solar energy. And this enabled the power supply, just the power supply, we're not talking about heating or transportation or anything else where not that much happened or even has happened. But where we saw a huge difference was in the way that solar and onshore wind expanded dramatically, changing not only the power supply of Germany, but its landscape. All of Southern Germany, if you've been, you know, is covered with solar panels. And in the North, the horizon is full of uh, wind turbines. I mean, Merkel 
as I said, at first was called, hailed as the climate chancellor. At the same time, she did things that actually caused her to lose that title. She, for example, uh, lobbied very heavily in Brussels to undermine strict standards for lowering the energy usage of, of, of automobiles. She was absolutely the spokesperson of the German uh, car manufacturers in Brussels. Um, there was not a wide expansion of, 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 of electric mobility or uh, in the public transportation. Uh, and in the past six or seven years, actually, the, the expansion of, of renewable energy slowed down a lot. The feed-in tariff that I mentioned, these price supports were done away with, leaving Germany for many years in a situation that no longer was renewable energy supported with subsidies, if that's what you want to call them, but only the fossil fuel industry, which still is. Recently, that's changed a little, but, but not a lot. Um, Critics, uh, including myself, think that Merkel could have and should have done much more um, to expand renewable energy and the build out of the, of the smart grid and other ancillary mechanisms, which would have enabled Germany to lower its uh, 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 carbon emissions and greenhouse gases. Um, as I will, okay, oh, here's another, okay, here's another power generation. You see how renewables shut up. Okay, brown coal went down a bit. You see nuclear going down. But nevertheless, not all that much. What's impressive is the way that nuclear, that renewables shot up, not the way that fossil fuels have gone down. I mean, here we see that by 2019, Germany was no longer a leader in the European Union in terms of you know, gross electricity consumption, you know, renewable, that, that share which renewable accounted, but, you know, around the top, actually, it's kind of, you know, upper middle. Um, Germany was way out in front in the beginning, and this was fueled largely from below. West Germany, in West Germany in particular, there was a huge grassroots renewable energy movement on the level of um, in communities and in municipalities um, that took over their energy works or set up their own um, uh, renewable energy companies or uh, Genossenschaften, collect different kinds of collectives. Uh, the movement was really driven from below. But at a certain point, uh, it, got to, it got to the fact that when more was needed than just kind of a grassroots movement. And the Merkel government, the Christian Democrats were, did not have the wherewithal to, to, to do that. And so other countries, and you see those above Germany, um, took over in, in different ways, Sweden and, and Denmark. I mean, Portugal went from almost nothing now to so that, you know, many weeks of the, of, of, in the summer, uh, Portugal is used 100% solar energy. Um, you know, Great Britain was able to, to, to lower its carbon emissions much more than Germany. And here we have a really quite a damning look at the way that carbon emissions, greenhouse gases have gone down. You know, there was this huge drop everywhere where former communist countries here, I mean, you're talking about East Germany, Eastern Germany, of course, all of the industry went under and carbon emissions went way down, uh, EU legislation that increased the energy efficiency of appliances and to a certain extent to, to automobiles as well, also caused for that. But then, you know, you see around 2000 and, and, and 2011 or so, I mean, you see basically kind of an evening out and, you um, you know, at certain points, some of these years, you can see emissions even pop up a little bit. And uh, environmentalist Greens have been very critical of Germany's inability to bring down emissions. Now, one of the things that I think outsiders don't realize, when you look at when we looked at the the increase in um, in renewable energy, you think, wow, that's that's huge. I mean, that's you know, like you know, going up like this. But what happened was that coal plants 
and gas and oil didn't decrease. So the coal plants, even on days when there was high amounts of renewable energy, they were still going at 100%. And they were exporting coal power primarily to France and then the Czech Republic, but anywhere where they were attached to the European grid. So what they failed to do completely was to phase out of coal at the same time that we were increasing renewable energy, which led to the, this, this state of affairs here where we see a drop in carbon emissions, but nothing like that, which has to happen for Germany to come anywhere close to reaching what it has to by 2030, 2040, or 2050 to become net zero. Um, in the last days of the Merkel government, there were um, you know, a number of different um, uh, things that happened, uh, you know, constitutional court case, EU rulings that forced the government to set higher uh, goals, um, that there be net zero by, by 2045, that there be a, a, a decrease from 1990 levels of emissions by, by 55% by 2030, et cetera. But as we know, you can make these, there, that's, there's, it's, easy, it's easy to set these goals you have to then put into process um, mechanisms that are going to make it happen. And uh, one of the reasons I think that the, that the, the Merkel government then was, was voted out of power, just a second, um, uh, uh, this year was that um, its failure to come up with a really convincing vision of what, um, uh, what, what Christian democracy in Germany would do for the future. I mean, the, the candidate for the Christian Democrats after Merkel uh, stepped down and she had a successor who she basically handpicked, a, a, a woman, Annegret Kramp-Karrenbauer, AKK, um, who didn't last very long, who didn't have much of a vision, any vision at all, actually, of how Christian democracy can be renewed after, after this long Merkel tenure. And then she... In, in a in a in, in a cock up with the far right, as a matter of fact, um, was forced out of the position. Laschet, I mean Laschet, the the, the minister president of Nordrhein Westfalen, took over. He was also a, a liberal, definitely a liberal conservative, as was uh, Kram uh, but also somebody who didn't really wasn't able to fill this this empty vessel with with any any convincing vision for the future. And this is often, it's the, the defeat, the, the terrible defeat that the Christian Democrats uh, suffered in the election, the worst ever um, uh, uh, result that they had ever in, the, in, in post-war history was blamed on Laschet for being weak. He made lots of mistakes and he ran a terrible campaign. All of that is definitely true, but more than anything, I mean, Mer I think Merkel uh, deserves a lot of the blame. I mean, she handed to him a Christian democracy that didn't have much to it. I mean, she had completely run out of steam years ago. Um, and Christian democracy had, and the Christian democracy, at least German Christian democracy, isn't one. As I said, they're not, they ne never are conservatives big on vision and program and ideas and agenda. You know, they feel that they're they're meant to rule and that they will rule and that they should rule and that their natural their natural place in society is 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 to rule, not necessarily to come up with transformative ideas, but rather to protect the structures and traditions and and, and ways that exist. Um, and so I I I, I attribute um, the the loss as much to Merkel as as to anybody else. And so now, where are we? Okay, let me summarize here. I mean, we have a situation where I said, um, you know, there's hardly a, a now now that um, that the Austrian People's Party I no longer consider a, a liberal conservative party, um, and with it probably leaving office anyway, with Merkel leaving office, I mean, basically, I mean, nowhere in Europe, on continental Europe, is there a modern uh, de a Christian democratic party. Um, those in France and Italy aren't even, are hardly worth the name. So that leaves German Christian democracy with a very particular and particularly important 
task ahead of it, which is to renew itself and come up with a convincing version of Christian democracy, of modern center right, of modern conservatism that will hopefully, you know, play a constructive role in Germany and continue to serve as a um, as as a beacon for other conservatives in Europe and not least, not at all least, Central Europe, where um, I would argue over the past 30 years has not had a single party, a liberal, modern, Christian democratic party that has remained in power for a significant amount of time. And today, I think nowhere. And one of the questions I'd certainly like to explore with you is why is that? And you know what, what needs to happen in Central Europe for there to be a modern conservatism that arise in modern conservative parties that will take away some of the power and credence and voters um, of illiberal conservatism or radical conservatism, which is really the dominant stripe in, in Central Europe. But you can't blame Central Europe. When you look in you know, Western Europe, the situation isn't much better. So, I mean, what has to be done also in, in France and in Italy? And, um, you know, we can ask ourselves as well, what's happening in the United Kingdom and the United States as well, and with the Republicans and the Tories. So conservatism, as I said, and I'll wrap up with that, you know, is in deep crisis um, and everywhere. Uh, there's a, there's a, a struggle going right on right now in Germany for the soul of Merkel's party. There are two, two candidates at the moment who are running for the party. One of them is, is, is Friedrich Merz, who endorses, I mean, he sees Sebastian Kurz as, as, a, as, 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 as a model. I think he has a very helmet call. He's a critic of Merkel from the very beginning. He has, a, he's, a very, he's deeply conservative. I think he still has his head in the coal era, but at the same time, he's one of these Christian Democrats who's strongly pro-market. He's, he's very um, you know, pro-liberal in this sense. And um, it's gonna be hard, I think, for Merz to find space for the Christian Democrats between the AfD, the far right, on the one hand, I mean, he has many of his ideas on migration and, and, and race and things, you know, are, are, are similar to the AfD. He thinks a more conservative cultural policy will win back voters from the AfD who were lost to the CDU because of Merkel's shift to the center. Very important. Um, but on the other hand, we have a pro-market party, the, the, the Free Democrats, a liberal party that's going to be in power. So I, I can't imagine that, that that line in itself is going to win many voters as well. Um, there's a, another man whose name is uh, Norbert Rutkin, who is much more liberal, um, and he does have some ideas. I think he's got a few more ideas that he's not very popular in the party. He's also, I mean, Rutkin and Merz, they ran against Kramp-Kauernbauer, Kramp they ran against Laschet, they lost twice. Um, I guess they're going to run again. I don't know. Maybe somebody else will run as well. There's no clear successor to Merkel. There's no clear align. There are no clear ideas as to what direction the party is going to go. So it's, 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 it's wide open. And we're going to see a lot of conflict within the party. It took the Social Democrats a long time to get their act together. And my cautious um, prediction is it's going to take the Christian Democrats a long time, too. But I, I do, um, in contrast maybe to myself of 20 years ago, I don't think I would have said I hope that they do. Um, but I do. I do hope that the Christian Democrats get their, get their act together and continue to serve as a liberal model for the rest of Europe.